every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. So welcome to the Upset Podcast, where we learn that most successes come from massive failure and how we pivot those failures and make failure our friend is what this is about. And I'm so excited to have an amazing guest, Hugh Weber. I've known Hugh for a while now, and just to give you a little bit of background on him so you know the information you're gonna be getting from this very, very smart, intelligent person. He is uh, the current president of Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment. He was also the president of the New Jersey Devils. Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment owns the Sixers and the Devils and Prudential Arena in our favorite city of Newark. Uh, He was the former president of New Orleans Pelicans, formerly the Hornets, uh, former VP of Ventura Foods, going way back, right? He serves on NHL's Executive Inclusion Committee and this is a very cool one. He's held as of 2007, and this I, I, I learn something new about someone every day, the men's 3,000 meter steeplechase record from the University of Puget Sound. Now that is cool. That makes this whole podcast fun for me. And the most important thing that he does is he's a father of four, two daughters and two sons. And as we all know, family means a lot to both of us. So Hugh, welcome, excited to have you. And it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I can't wait to expose my failures. For sure. There you go. Listen, <laughs> the only reason why we're sitting here talking is because both of us had, has had many of them. So I appreciate Probably could have had my ex-wife on. on. She could have been more proficient at it than me. <laughs> Listen, you know, to each his own, to each his own. I'm kidding. So, uh, so what I find interesting that, you know, early in your career, it wasn't sports, right? You, you talk about Procter & Gamble and Ventura Foods where, where you started. So talk a little bit about that. Like, how did you get into that? Why? What made that be sort of your first choice of, of career move? Yeah, so um, I was not that kid who dreamt every night before I went to bed of what it would mean to run a baseball team or a football team. It just never was part of my dream. Um, I, uh, as a young person and a young athlete, um, I was competitive in track and field, as you said. And and by the way, just to correct you, I wish it was 2007, but I was not in college in 2007. It was 1990. uh, No, you held the record till 2007. (laughs) I mean, I was trying to give you longevity Uh, here. Like what, like, you know. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, Yeah, so it's good. (laughs) Um, uh, But I was, I was really, really on a journey of my personal life and this is going to sound like i was an old soul but i had some amazing people in my life teachers coaches and i wanted to have that level of impact on other people i did and so uh for me it was all about running teams and or having an impact and so being raised roman catholic my first thing in middle school was i wanted to be a priest i wanted to have an impact on people's lives and and uh, then quickly discovered with, you can't have a family. Uh, and so that was uh, quickly next. And then teacher coach was kind of the next natural iteration that a young person thinks about. And what I learned through my experiences at, at, in university and then eventually as I got out is that the impact of being able to run business teams, being able to pull ass people around really difficult objectives, really hard things to get done um, working with adults at that level um, was something that really made me excited. So I got my professional training at Procter & Gamble out of school and then went to go work um, for a company that was really more of a startup, uh, Ventura Foods. It was a $200 million startup at the time. And, and over the course of the next eight years, built it to about a $2.5 billion entity. So I learned in the, the teams and the size of teams of what I was building and doing got bigger and larger and the scale became um, uh, much larger in in a sense that I was really gratified doing that. And I happened to be uh, in the late 90s in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, running a a big division for them. And I happened to meet 
um, a guy who owned uh, an NBA team at the time, George Shin, in Charlotte, the Charlotte Hornets at the time. And uh, I think there's a lesson here about networking and, and being open to how people's relationships can grow into other possibilities. And um, he was somebody who saw something in me about how I carried myself, what my background was. And he said, you got to get into sports, like you're perfect for it. And um, it was a marriage of my commitment to having an impact on people's lives, being able to run things at a high level operationally that he saw. And uh, it took him a few years. I helped him on a few projects. And then finally, um, I asked myself the nagging question, will I ever regret, you know, not taking a chance on myself? Will I ever regret the fear of failure in terms of the subject matter here today? And the answer was no, I'm not afraid to fail at this. If I can't do it all, I, I can't do it. Well, that was uh, 23 years ago. And so, so let me ask you a question, because that's sure. interesting. And obviously, uh, not being afraid, I think, is, you know, that's a failure too, right? Like, because you won't know unless you try. And if you feel failure is just a learning lesson, you normally will maybe try more things. But you still have to gain some confidence. And I've gained most of mine through what went wrong, not went right, because I was able to get myself through it. During those eight years, I mean, dude, you build this thing to a large entity, division or not. I know Procter & Gamble's gigantic. Right. And, and I'm sure you're around a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge that could assist you. But what, what, prob, what, what gave you the confidence to be able to actually feel that? What, what were the things that maybe did go wrong that you learned during that eight years? You know, obviously managing teams, because I believe like no one does it themselves. Like, right. you know, the greatest things that are ever created always had multiple people involved. So, so what, do, what do you, what do you think if you could point back to anything that was, uh, you know, something that would, would help the audience? What, what would you think? Right. That would be? You can imagine these were really formative years of, of me as a human being, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid twenties and moving into my late twenties and I'm learning what it means to be not only a, a man, but a husband and a father. And I'm learning what it means to run teams. And, um, and so part of that process, um, is understanding your what i call your craft what are you gifted what what and i believe that god has put all of us on this earth for a special mission whatever that is and has given us special skills abilities and talents to do those things and half the time i'm i'm, I'm you're trying to figure out what that is because if you can actually tap into it um you're doing uh, really really great things and so i found that i had this ability to connect with people connect people and and get them and contextualize what the problem and the challenge was that we were going to go do together and manage the trust on a team to keep open and transparent uh, conversations going. And, and that was something that actually was inspiring to me when I saw, and I think we've all maybe, if you've, if you've ever been on a team before, whether it's a, a little league baseball team, whatever, where the aggregation of the people and what they produced and how they work together was way better than their individual talents. We've always talked about that, but when you've ever been a part of that, you say, you look around, you're like, you know, there's nobody here that's all that great, but we, we seem to be a great team. That was the kind of, of... It's like the Bad News Bears. You remember exactly. that old, old movie, The Bad News Bears? That was yeah. one of my favorite movies when I was a kid, and it just showed what that what you're saying is so accurate. Yeah, and so that was, that, that was the, the special sauce that I was always seeking. And so the question was then, I think you, what you're getting to is the, these, these failures. What was the, the big lessons that maybe taught me what was working and what wasn't? And I... I've always been wired in a way, and I'm not sure if it came from my parents or being the youngest of five, I'm not sure where it came from, but I was always looking for that marginal way to improve. You know, Sometimes we look at failure and success as binary. It's either you did it or you didn't, you either won or you didn't. You know, And I think success and failure are, is much more um, you know, uh, uh, interesting if you get inside of what could you have done better? It's this idea of continually pressing yourself and pushing yourself. And so I could tell you in that course of time where I was, you know, managing three people, I remember a situation I walked in the room and we were not hitting our numbers. We were not doing what, and I, I was going to be that hard line, you know, come on, we got to get out there. And I was the youngest guy by far, right? You know, I had got you know, men and women that were 20 years older than me and they just turned on me, you know? And so I remember that moment, you know, mid-20s, you know, running a team, you're like, 
what I learned is like, you got to be your authentic self. That wasn't me. That was something I read that you got to be tough sometimes. You got to go in. You got. And so finding those those small, you know, those small failures, those things along the way that actually help you figure out your craft and what you're super good at have been something I've carried through even to this day. You know, I, I so I like Tony Robbins. I he energizes me. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older now. So, you know, he's been around for years and years and years. He must be doing something right and well. Uh, but he, he has this thing called can I, like constant and never ending improvement, which that's like, I'm, I'm digging how you're putting what, you know, a new definition of what actually this big word failure that we all use all the time really is. It's, it's, if you're constantly open to what you can be better at and not look at it as this fixed mindset that like you said i'm either good or bad right or wrong gonna win or lose right like all, all these like you know opposite statements that we sort of use as mantras in business and in life and in you know and in sports you know even when we play golf right uh i love that i i because i i think what it does is it takes it down a notch to actually make it more what it is rather than this big crazy event so very very and, cool and john i would tell you i'm having now applied and seen and observed this in professional sports i will tell you the hall of fame athletes those that have pushed themselves to the greatest limits of their ability talk about that their ability to look back at even success and figure out those one or two things they could have and should have done better and then apply those the next time and um i think it's it's across the board i think that that is it, it, it's it's a it's a skill set that just becomes habitual now it takes a special person to do that and a special culture organization i'll tell you at harris blitzer sports entertainment early on we found a bunch of like-minded people that thought the same way, right? It wasn't enough just to pull off an incredible event. It wasn't enough to to have hit your budget or do whatever. And uh, we did a uh, never forget tribute classic here. It was a, a two two game um, tournament, uh, college basketball, raised money for the the, the victims, uh, surviving children of uh, 9/11 for scholarships. Great, you know, do you know whatever the, the, the schools were. And the first year we did it, we had a group of about six of us stand around and we, we did a summary of the last, you know, the full day. And we were nitpicking on the littlest, littlest thing. And there were a couple of people like, you guys are insane. Like this was the most spectacular CBS broadcast that they've had. Everyone told us this was the best event. And we were knitting on those little things because that's that was just the mindset, you know, that was the culture we had. And you have to be strong enough for that. Because it's that, it, in context, it sounds like to someone who doesn't think that way, that you're just focusing on the negative, and you're not. You know, you're celebrating all the things that went well. Well, I, I think you're, 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 it's like the journey thing, right? Like yeah. we we say that all the time. The most fun is doing what you do. At least I, that you know, I I feel the same way. I like you you do got to stop and smell the roses sometime. I I believe that, right? Especially, you know. You can't just keep moving on and moving on and sort of not look at like, wow, this is a really cool thing. But that has its little bit of time. But I, I, I find the most fun I ever have is figuring out how to do things. And then when I figured it out, how to keep figuring and figuring and figuring, which, you know, it's iterating, iterating, you know, you call it pivoting, iterating. It's sort of how startups even become what they end up becoming because none of them really end up what they first started right. to be. I'm sure you had that same experience at yep. your, at yep. the food, you know, at the food company. So a question here. So you, you get to the Hornets, right? You, you, you met that one person, you were open to it. You're not afraid to make a change and believe in yourself, right? That's, that's all you really have at that point is what your experiences were and believing in yourself. And you made that move. And then you know, you're displaced by Hurricane Katrina, right? Like, like right away, you come into this new thing and boom, you know, impact, chaos, horrible, saddest thing ever, right? How did you get through that? Uh, what in your career prepared you for that a little bit? And, and you know, how, how'd you make it through to the other side? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, terrible. Uh, for maybe even for many of your listeners, Hurricane Katrina is a uh, historic, you know, probably the, lo the greatest storm that ever hit the U U.S. coast. Um, but it's really hard 
to to give it enough uh, uh, credence in terms of the impact that it had, not only in that community, but um, on the lives of uh, literally half a million people. Um, it's terrible. It was 85% of the, the city was under eight feet of water, you know? And so um, I think initially we had um, the incredible uh, support of the NBA, which is a global entity. David Stern personally stepped in. Uh, within uh, four weeks, we had Oklahoma City as a, our, a place that we were going to uh, relocate for, for, we didn't know how long, if it was gonna be six weeks, six months, six years, we had no idea. Um, and, you know, we had uh, um, uh, a group of uh, galvanized and committed, you know, employees that, you know, really were committed to seeing the team actually continue to compete. And so uh, initially it was survival. I, I'd love to tell you that, like, oh, we sat back and we had this really, you know, we were sat in a bunker room and we mapped it out. Like, no, it was like, do people have money in their, their checking accounts? Do we have uh, mo moving buses? Do we have places to live? Like we, we literally had to start from scratch. Um, and then um, you have this nuance of, of actually having to compete. So if you think about this, uh, end of August is when the storm happens. The NBA schedule starts in late September. So yep. you're literally competing and, and going out and doing so. Um, in, in three weeks, and most teams have eight months to nine months to plan for these types of things. So I would tell you, uh, there are uh, probably 16 podcasts we could do just about the learnings of Katrina and what it meant uh, as a leader, as an executive, as someone who was trying to build up people. Because you can imagine when people showed up for work, do you think they were thinking about the what kind of ticket prices they should put on next week? No. Do you think they were thinking about what the poster should look like for next week? No, they were, their house was devastated. They've literally lost everything. They were trying to figure out where they get their kids in school, right? So being empathetic and understanding that, you know, you had to help people contextualize the work that had to be done and yet understand that they had all this other stuff going on in their life. It's, it's, a, it's a lesson that, to me that's also pretty applicable as part of this pandemic that we've lived through. I mean, like, it's not enough, the work that we do during the day, it's now 24 seven. And by the way, there's a whole bunch of anxiety and stress that we have. So again, um, the learnings were, were uh, tremendous through that whole uh, experience. And then two years later, um, the learning started all over as we re-entered the New Orleans market, went back to a city that uh, was desperately in need for, for some, some support and, and for some validation that they were a real city. And we returned there and uh, we fought to, to keep the team. And, and the good news is you said the Pelicans are still there and have a long history in that market. It's it, it's so funny, right? Like just looking back now about you a little bit more. And again, you know, you learn about people the more you have conversations, you know, saying you want to be a priest, like who could have been the better person to actually be there at the time? It's It's pretty incredible, right? Like, the mindset that you even started out with this podcast saying your whole thing is how do I help people? How do I manage teams to be able to mobilize? And, you know, thank God survival had you in it because, right. you know, not always do you have the right person at the right time uh, for the situations that we all go through uh, and we all have to lean in and deal with it. But thank God you were there. That That's incredible. Right. And that, I want, to, I want to add something to that, John, because you asked an important question before. Is like, how did you have the confidence to do this? Because like, it had never been done before. You never ran a team before, and then, oh, you 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 manage a team through a, a national disaster. How did you do that? It goes back to what you just touched upon. I literally got up every morning saying, "This is why I'm here. I was built to do this. This is what I do." Like when everything else is falling to shit. This is what I do. Like this is like I'm exactly where I should be, and that gave me confidence to know that whatever I did, it was going to be the right thing. That's 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 so good, and you know, horrible thing. And thank God you were there, and that it all you know is where it is today. Uh, all right, so here you are. You're at the Pelicans. You, you did your thing. You're there for a while, and then the Devils, right? So not not, not only now are you in sports, you're bopping around to different sports. It's like Right. You know, I, I understand the people that are like they're in basketball, they stay in basketball, they're in hot, you know, you're, you're, you know, which, so tell me how you were able to make that decision. Well, there was, a, there's an important part of that story pivoting from NBA team in New Orleans to 
multifaceted, you know, team enterprise in Harris Blitzer Sports. In 2012, my sole purpose was to get that team financially stable and to get it sold. The NBA had bought it. It was distressed. We got it solid. We got it fixed. And we got it sold to uh, <clears throat> Mr. Tom Benson, who owned the Saints at the time down in Louisiana. And he was committed to the marketplace. It was the perfect, perfect thing because the NBA got their money. Everyone was happy. But they didn't need me anymore, right? So you think about failure. So if anybody has not been fired before, I highly recommend it. It's really, <laughs> really great <laughs> because it makes you evaluate. It's like, because you literally have to wake up in the morning and say, you know what? They're going to pay me not to come into work. What kind of value do I bring when they're paying me not to show up? Like, honestly, because you, you think because you're right. You want it, right, right, exactly. But what it forced me to do is figure out what I really wanted. What really motivated me? What inspired me? What what was I drawn to? And so I spent a lot of time looking at different opportunities in sports, different things that were happening on. And 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 there were three three elements that came up for me time and time again. People, um, you got to work for the right people. You got to work with the right people. You have to have the right partners. And, and I think you'll attest to this. You and I have shared a lot of stories about having the right right. Your family has to be happy, of course. Like, you know, you have to be in a situation where your family can thrive and that you can, you know, put them in an environment that's great. And what I learned about myself is like, I like really complicated projects. I like really complicated puzzles. I like things that are hard. Like the New Orleans Pelicans, that was hard. That was really freaking hard. And what I saw in this portfolio with the Sixers, the Devils, and what I saw in Josh Harris and David Blitzer, I saw a complicated puzzle, something that they were trying to do, it hadn't been done before. I saw two really great committed guys, family guys, and an environment in New Jersey where my family would be, you know, would thrive. And so those were the three elements that came together for me that has turned into now a nine year project. So the learning lesson for the younger people on career movement is like, industry isn't a thing for you it's it's solving problems like puzzles where some people it might be i just love basketball so much whatever i can do to be in and around it i will right. but what i love what you said which i think is the biggest lesson of like how you move through your career is knowing that like being clear about yourself you know i always say you know, take a character test to learn more about yourself. Because until you really learn about yourself, it's very difficult to be, who, like you said, who you are with that special gift, whatever our gift is. And it's scary to find it, but I, you know, moving through it's, it's the hardest thing. When I, when I counsel young people that are either coming out of college or early in their careers, it's the hardest part of the journey is to figure out what you want and what you're good at, right? That's the hardest part. And when you figure that out, everything else is easy, right? I have people come to me all the time because they say, oh, I want to work in sports. And I want to do your job. I'm like, great. Why do you want to work in sports? Because like, as you said, I love basketball. I love hockey. I'm like, great. I said, do you like do you like steak? And they go, yeah, I love steak. I'm like, do you want to work at a meat a, a butcher shop? Like, I, I don't think like, you have to do more than just love the subject. Right. Matter. Right. Because right, listen, no matter what, we all have these talents that because any company has multifaceted things going on. It has sales. It has accounting. It has legal, right? It has all the components of what your skill set might be unbelievably matched to that industry. So, but you got to find that for yourself. And then listen, it's, it's gravy if you actually are in an industry and you find that and you're clear with yourself that you actually like are excited about, right? Like right. It's, it, it's like a, it's like a bonus point. All right. So you're at, so, you, okay. So you make this move. And now you, you know, I, I obviously it's a great company, great people, uh, and you get in there, and you know, what was your most epic failure? And like now you have a lot of experience, right? You have a lot of confidence. You think you're clear on you. What, where did what, what did you need to do to sort of break through this new venture? Well, there's so many failures. Um, I think I'll talk about the, maybe the most recent ones, you know, the ones that happened through, uh, you know, COVID, you know, probably. Um, we were such great stewards of the business. You know, we wanted to manage the bottom line and manage the, the branding and making sure that our, our fans are engaged and in love with our teams and all of this stuff. And 
and sometimes you make the decision what you think is best for the business, you know, and um, and it turns out to be uh, a huge mistake. And so in this case, it was early on. So this is March of 2019, and, and uh, uh, the CEO at the time, Scott O'Neill, and I, we got together and we said, "Listen, we've got to prepare this business and our people." And so we, as a leadership team, on every side, basketball, hockey, whatever, got together and said, all for one and one for all. So if if our business is going to be decimated because we're not going to be able to do concerts, whatever, are we all willing to take a haircut on our compensation to keep everybody's jobs intact? And the answer was, yes, of course. Like This is the culture we built, of course. We took that to our, our, our principals, took it to the board, and they said, that's really commendable. That's it's a reflection of the, the culture. It's a reflection of, and yet we did it at a time when all of the newness of what was happening, and it leaked, it leaked to the press that that the employees were willing to do this, and it had a poor reflection on our our board. It did because they were like, "How can you be doing this to these people during this time?" And it was like, <laughs> "Oh, no, it was our idea," <laughs> you know. It was, it, it's actually cool for us. But the problem was, is like, it, I was such an epic blind spot. I didn't see, there was a moment in time early in the pandemic where people were bashing people with wealth and means. And I didn't, I was tone deaf to it. I didn't see that. You know, I didn't understand the implications publicly that these teams sometimes take on. And so it was a mistake. It was a huge mistake. And we quickly had to retrace it and, and uh, you know, we moved forward. But that was probably one that was like, made me understand this pandemic's different. Like the rules have changed. This, you don't do as best for business always, you can't, you know. Right. You have to do what's, you know, in the, in the context of the, of the larger, what's happening in society. Interesting. It's so weird, because you could look at that both ways. I, I mean, I was, as you're explaining, I was thinking, wow, that's cool, right? And then you, you, it's amazing how everyone has different viewpoints on things, you gotta be careful. So, so obviously the pandemic, you know, we're, we're, we're like two years from then. Uh, what do you, what, what were some, I mean, and listen, what you do, I mean, obviously restaurants, entertainment, you know, everyone's been hit in different ways, you know, uh, software companies, different than entertainment companies, different than restaurants, different than accounting firm, you know, everyone had issues during this and had to get through it. But you, you know, your whole existence is people coming to a place and gathering and enjoying something. And like, like, so what else did you have to deal with, you think, that made you a better leader during this process or what you've learned? Yeah, you know, so, lessons? so the one thing we didn't have, John, two years ago is context. Like we didn't, if you had said at the beginning, hey, John, this is a two and a half year runway. It's gonna take us two and a half years to get through this. But much like that experience that I had in New Orleans in 2000, whatever, uh, five, with Katrina, we didn't know if it would take how, how long. And I think if all of us had known a little bit better, so I think if I had paced our employees a little bit better, if we had understood what they needed at any given moment, but but initially, and what our fans need right now is safety. They need to know when they gather and they come here, they know they're gonna have a good time. They know that they're gonna be caught up with their loved ones, but that can they do so in an environment where they're not gonna be, you know, uh, sick, or not gonna be uh, sick. And that's really what we put all of our effort over the last, you know, two years is trying to make sure that these arenas are places that people can gather. And I think you're seeing people's comfort level actually, you know, uh, grow. And we, we, we see a very small segment of the population that are waiting until we get through every wave of, of, uh, of the virus. Um, but I think most people feel like, you know, this is a place they can come and root for their team. And, and, uh, I think so too. Listen, everyone has different like levels of everything, right? So that's what makes, you know, living so fun is that everyone's different and right. we all learn how to live together in, in a positive way. So out of all the things you've been through, the route you've taken, would you, is there anything different you would do it? Is there a, a, any like pivot you would have made or would you do it all over again the same way? And you know, how, how do you feel about, you know, where you are today? Yeah, professionally, I would say, so 
the, the same rigor that I apply professionally, which is this this kind of micro you know understanding of where I could have been better, I, I apply to myself personally as well. I, 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 as you said, this journey of continual improvement, I think is something that hits all aspects of your life. Um, I think your question really, to me, applies more personally. Are there things in moments in time with your children and or moments in time with uh, a friend or a colleague where you wish you could have and should have, you know, done something differently. Um, of course, you know, that could have, you know, uh, changed, you know, uh, many aspects of my life. Professionally, though, I feel like, you know what, if you, if you wake, again, wake up every morning knowing that you were put on this earth to do a certain thing and you, this is built for you, I feel like I've, I've maintained that commitment and bring that kind of energy to my, my work. Um, and so I don't know if there's anything I would rescript to be honest, professionally. That's great. That's great. I, I mean, listen, obviously being open to the constant and never ending improvement, uh, cycle that you go through, it would be hard to actually name anything that big. Cause it seems like you're doing that all the time and, and, and every day and every hour, which I think, uh, is sort of it, it like levels out the journey of it right it, it doesn't make everything so big or so little it just makes it another thing that you learn that day and I, it's it's incredible uh and you know listening to how you've walked through what you've walked through uh as far as your your career is is just you know it's incredible and uh you've done such great things and you know so happy that uh we were able to have this conversation. Uh, I'm so glad you came on as my guest. And, you know, everyone here, obviously, let's go see a, a, an event at the Prudential Center, right? Whether it's a, uh, a game or a concert, and we're looking forward to doing that in 22. Uh, and thanks so much for being on. I, I, I can't, you know, thank you enough. No, I think this is a great format. Um... Again, I, I think that uh, to be able to focus in on areas that people have failed and, and done so with courage, I think is an amazing, uh, uh, you know, hopefully helpful to people. And again, as you said earlier, you, you have to be open to it. You have to be open to being able to say, I could fall on my face in front of everybody and that's okay. Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank you again. And I want to thank everyone for uh, listening to this podcast. Uh, more to come, more great guests like you in store. Uh, looking forward to uh, seeing everyone again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks.